Welcome to the first Once Upon a Wasteland minisode, Character Matters, Elizabeth Kirby. One note before we get started, I will take great pains to avoid spoilers, but I can't make any guarantees that something won't slip out. I'll do my best, but I can't make any promises. I'm Brad Williams, the creator of Once Upon a Wasteland, and you may also know me as the voice of Modus, and I think it's up to five or six other characters at this point, on the Modus Files. These minisodes are intended to provide a peek behind the curtain and provide some insight into the show, the story, the characters, and in some cases, the people behind them. For the theme for this minisode, I put a poll up on Twitter. You can follow the show's Twitter while I'll put up polls like this at onceupon76pod. The winner was Character Origins, and I think that's a really great place to start, so it's a perfect candidate for our inaugural episode. I landed on the title Character Matters for the double meeting. Obviously, we will be discussing matters surrounding the characters in the show. But also, for me, character does matter. In fact, I'd say it's the most important thing about the show. It's, it's what drives the story forward. The characters, their relationships, their dynamics, all of those things work together to make this show what it is. This really is a story that's built on characters and on character dynamics. So I'm glad that Character Origins won the day because it is a perfect intro to that peek behind the curtain. But before we get to that, one of the things that I wanted to make a part of each of these minisodes is reading any new reviews that we have. I know that Apple Podcasts allows reviews. I believe that Spotify just rolled out the ability to review shows. They rolled out ratings a, a, a couple of months ago. So any new reviews that we get, any new five-star reviews, we will read them on the air. And as of right now, we have two existing reviews, both of them from Apple Podcasts. And I want to start with one that was left by I Am The Buttercat on January 18th of this year. And it's titled Swoon, an audio drama for all types. Genesis here to say, I have never played a Fallout game. I understand some references because the internet is the internet, but even with that said, I really enjoy this podcast. Even not fully understanding the small nods to the game, I'm still really interested in the story unfolding. I love when exes can still be friends and not have it be awkward. Thank you very much, Genesis. And I want to note, Genesis is one of the two voices of the fabulous podcast Two Girls, One Ship, which is a podcast that dives deep on video game romances. It's really great. It's available on the same podcast platforms that Once Upon a Wasteland is, and I highly recommend that you check it out. It's, it's, a, it's a fabulous podcast. Those two have great chemistry. The subject matter is always good. They have great guests. Definitely something worth checking out. So that, that is one of the things that I, that, I, that I try to build into the story, where Genesis mentioned not fully understanding the small nods of the game and never having played a Fallout game, but still being interested in the story. I, I really wanted to make the story accessible to people who were not Fallout fans, and people who had never played a Fallout game before, don't even have a passing understanding of the lore. I wanted people to be able to get it by context clues or, or anything else like that that I could slip in so that people would understand what was going on in this universe. But of course, I also wanted to make sure that it was a Fallout story and that people who were fans of Fallout didn't feel like, oh, well, this is just a story that, that happens to be set in this universe, but it's not really tied to it. So I think that's a, it's a tough line to walk. And it's, you know, one of those things that I, I probably veered on either side of it a few times here and there, but it's, it's great to hear from this review that, that somebody who isn't a Fallout fan is, is getting something out of it and is enjoying the story and is enjoying the characters. So thank you very much for that review, Genesis. Our second review was left on February 17th of this year, and it was left by Sassy Lady 1970 And the title for that one is, What an Amazing Show. This show has it all. Intrigue, romance, and subterfuge. Brilliant voice actors bring this story to life in a gripping way. Give it a listen, even if you don't play Fallout. So we can see a similar theme playing out there in this review. Um, Sassy Lady does play Fallout. She's a, a, a very well-regarded member of the Fallout community and the Fallout creative community. So it's nice to hear it from that perspective as well, from the perspective of somebody who does have a deep understanding of the Fallout universe and Fallout lore and is kind of deeply enmeshed in the Fallout community. So we get two perspectives there. And by the way, you can catch Sassy Lady on the Fallout Roundtable podcast, just like Two Girls, One Ship. You can find it on the same podcasting platforms that you can hear once upon a wasteland. Like I said, if you leave a five-star review on any of the platforms that, uh, that I have access to, Whenever we have a mini-sode, I will read it out and I will give you a shout-out. So keep leaving those five-star ratings and those five-star reviews. So let's talk about Elizabeth Kirby. Amanda, you're so much more than that. You always have been. 
Anyone who actually gets to know you understands that. My parents love you. Odessa absolutely adores you. These are all people who've seen the real Amanda Otis. They not only like you, they respect you. The people who only see you for your body or how beautiful your face is. With these scars? Yes, with those scars. Do you remember how I used to run my fingers along them? How I kissed them? Yeah. Everything about you is beautiful, Amanda. Even your scars. And I pity the people who thought that physical beauty is all you have to offer. Elizabeth Kirby is one of the co-lead characters of the show, along with Odessa Valdez. She is one half of the love story, the romance that that sort of drives the story forward. And she is really the audience focus character. I, I think that more so than Odessa, because Odessa is an NPC within the game and already has that kind of thing happening for her. Beth being based upon OC, and I'll get to that in, in a couple of minutes, I think that makes her position in the game a little bit more relatable. Now, that also comes with significant pitfalls, which I will also get into. As I mentioned, Beth began as OC, as my original character. She was the character that I began playing with when I first started playing Fallout 76 at launch on the PlayStation platform. So I guess the best place to start, and I won't go too deeply into detail here because I think this is a topic that's better suited for its own episode, but I think it's difficult to talk about where Beth came from and and how the transition from OC to the lead character in an actual story happened without talking about the modus files and how that whole process happened. So as I mentioned at the top, I am the voice of modus as well as a few other characters in the modus files, and I've been doing that since I think episode three or four. One of the things that Lawrence, the, the creator of the modus files, is really good about is encouraging people to get out there and create. And that's really what happened here. I was really enjoying watching him creating things and seeing that all come to fruition. So I threw a little bit of a test balloon up, which was a little briefing between Modus and Colonel Valeria, where they're talking about a new operative that is active in Appalachia. And of course, that operative is Elizabeth Kirby. The character wasn't really fully formed at that point. In fact, it was only broad strokes of the character. So I decided to just weave in aspects of my personal gameplay. Uh, When I play Fallout 76, I'm very cooperative. I like to help people. I don't like PvP, all those kinds of things. So this briefing was basically surrounding Modus's level of confusion about what this new operative is doing and what they want. And the stinger at the end, it was just a few lines, was her mission appears to be that she wants people to be nice to each other, which of course, you know, it, it was cute. It was, I think it was, it was a little bit, a little bit funny, but really that's where the character came from because everything flowed out of that. Once I got that out of the way and Lawrence was like, Hey, this actually sounds pretty cool. Why don't you maybe think about developing a story around it? So that little nugget from that little fake briefing played out into fleshing out her actual mission in Appalachia. Like, what does that mean? Why would a person who is accomplished enough and capable enough to be on Modus's radar, why would someone like that be in it to have people be nice to each other, right? It doesn't really seem logical. So I built in that her mission is actually to hold civilization together as a part of a larger team by doing what she can to make sure that the whole region doesn't fall into anarchy. And then that led into, well, she also is working behind the scenes to make sure that no one faction gains power unless and until they've they've proven that they're the right faction to do it. So she won't engage in terrorism or anything like that to stop, say, the Crater Raiders or Foundation or the Enclave or any other faction from gaining power But what she will do is provide aid or work behind the scenes in a way that will allow each of these factions to remain viable without ever getting to that point where they're going to be able to exert power over the other factions and and maybe take over. Now, the other thing that, that led to the creation of the story was how within Fallout 76 in Steel Dawn and Steel Rain, 
you do not have the ability to romance Scribe Valdez. You can flirt with her, and in one case, she shuts you down cold. In another case, she seems oddly receptive, but there's no way to actually romance her like you can with some other characters throughout the, the Fallout universe. That's how the story started. I wanted to basically say, what would happen if you could romance Scribe Valdez? What would Scribe Valdez in a romance look like? So that also informed how I constructed Beth. If I do an episode about Scribe Valdez specifically, I'll go into to more about this. But I will say, because my OC was going to be the other lead character, and I discovered in the game that it didn't matter what gender you were. If you flirted with Scribe Valdez, the response was always exactly the same. So I made Scribe Valdez canonically bisexual, because I think that's supported in the game by the interactions that she can have with player characters. That led to, okay, what about Beth? What should Beth's sexuality be? I settled on her being a lesbian rather than bisexual. One of the things I think that I wanted to do was I wanted to have people all across the, the sexuality spectrum be represented and, and be represented honestly. So I wanted to have people who were bisexual and actually have them be bisexual people because it seems like in mass media, bisexual is often used as code for homosexual, right? And it just always seemed disingenuous to me. I, I know a lot of bisexual people and they are attracted to and can fall in love with people of any gender. It, it's, it's the way it works. Yet in, in mass media, if there is a bisexual character, that character will almost invariably, because I don't, I don't think anybody needs to jump on me on Twitter and say, well, there's this example. I mean, there are examples where that's not the case. But for the most part, it really seems like they will always end up in a same-sex relationship. So I wanted to make sure that if I created a bisexual character if I created an asexual character, if I created a homosexual character or a heterosexual character, that that character was true to their sexuality. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to make sure about was when I created Odessa as bisexual, I wanted to make sure that she was well aware of her sexuality and that Beth was not what they call a closet key, where she, Odessa, thought that she was straight, but then she met this wonderful woman and fell in love, and oh my gosh, now, wow, she's bisexual, and she had no idea. I think the closet key trope is one that that can be handled well. I think that I probably could have handled it well, but I wasn't really interested in doing that. I wanted to have characters that were, for the most part, well aware of and confident in their sexuality and allow the relationships to play out that way. Another thing that I thought about quite a bit was what age should Beth be? And, of course, you can go any number of different directions with this. One of the things that I wanted to be part of her character was having been born in Vault 76. So this story takes place in 2104, which is after Steel Rain. That's 27 years after the bombs fell, so she would have to be 27 years old or younger. And I also wanted to make sure that I remain sort of cognizant of how old I wanted Odessa to be. Odessa's age is not, as far as I know, called out anywhere specifically in canon, but I think that she's probably in that 30-ish year old range. So I decided to make Beth 23. So she would have been born four years after Vault 76 closed up after the bombs fell. And I wanted to do that because I, I wanted to make sure that she was very much a child of the vault. Not only someone who spent her whole life in the vault, but began her life when people were sort of getting used to the idea of being in a vault, as opposed to, say, going in as a toddler or being born right when the vault doors closed. I wanted to have her feel like the vault was what was normal. And I think that having all the people in the vault understanding and, and being comfortable with being in the vault, which I think they probably would be, at least to whatever extent is reasonable, after four years, then... Having her born in 2081, I think, made sense from the perspective of the story. Now, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. I think one of the things that storytellers have to be careful about, and one of the things that I was very conscious of, is that characters need to act their age. When I decided to make Beth 23, I made it a point 
to make sure that she acted like she was 23. There is very little that is more jarring to me in a story, at least in terms of how a character is presented. If you have a character that is supposed to be a certain age, especially if it's a younger character, that doesn't act like a younger character. Like you have somebody that's a 45-year-old in terms of their behavior, in the terms of, of how they approach problems and how they approach conflict and any of those, those kinds of things, any of their, their reactions. It just doesn't work for me if you, if you have somebody who doesn't act the age that they're supposed to be. And I understand that within the Fallout universe, we're talking about characters that are dealing with living in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, and that is naturally going to make people grow up faster than they would in the real world here. I guess, you know, you could see that somebody growing up in an actual war zone in our timeline, they will grow up faster than somebody who lives in the suburbs or, you know, grew up in the middle of England like uh, some people I know. <laughs> but still, you, you can't use that as an excuse to make your character more wise than they should be or to seemingly draw upon life experiences that they do not have the ability to draw on based upon the actual amount of life experiences that they have had. In a case like that, just make your character older. There, there's nothing wrong with having an older character. I know one of the things in anime, for example, is that the characters tend to be very young. But even in a case like that, they're, they're presented as being young. They have extraordinary powers. They always come out on top, or virtually always come out on top. They're the good guys. But they're not good guys like Indiana Jones, right? They're not these these wise heroes with great life experience. It's it's really it's more about their enthusiasm and their 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 inherent skill or maybe they're they're a chosen one. But it's never because they're a 45-year-old in a 20-year-old's body. Did you really not tell her who you were giving the holotape to? I told her I was going to give it to a friend. Come on, Beth. What? Are we not friends? You left out a lot of context. No wonder she's pissed off. She's not stupid. What was I supposed to do? Tell her that I'm going to give the tape to my ex-girlfriend, who's a raider, and oh, by the way, we still have sex now and again. That can be a difficult thing to accomplish or to keep in mind, especially when you're talking about a lead character like Beth. So the way that I went about that was I made sure to allow her to make bad decisions and to react inappropriately. It's not that she's immature as such. I think that as 23-year-olds go, Beth is very mature. But she's also not going to react in the same way to a situation as somebody who's been through a lot more has. And that's the kind of thing that's going to play out in myriad ways, and it really can make the story more interesting and it can make the character more interesting. Because if you establish that the character is not always going to make the right decisions and they are going to do things that maybe make you scratch your head or, or want to shake your fist at the at your podcast player of choice, then that's okay because perfect characters are not particularly interesting. And I think the way that they're imperfect is vitally important, not only to making them believable, but to making them relatable. And relatable characters are probably the number one key to success for a story like this one that, like I said at the beginning, is a character-driven story about characters and their relationships and the dynamics between them. I want people to, even though they're not a six-foot-tall redhead with super-secret spy training, to be able to relate to this character. Because I think that at a core level, people are people. And even though we might not have gone through the specific things that we allude to Beth having gone through in the past, or the things that she does go through as a part of this story, I think that her human reactions and the human way that she handles relationships makes people want to root for her and makes people want to follow her story. At least that's what I hope. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm shooting for here. And I think that one of the things that can really harm a listener's ability to relate to a character like this is if you have someone who is 23 like Beth is, and they're reacting the way that I would react to something, right? Because a person is going to sit there and listen and go, well, 
I wouldn't have reacted that way when I was 23, or if they are similar to that age, well, I am that age, and that's completely out of character for how someone my age would react. So it's one of those things that I think is very important in drawing believable characters and also in making sure that those characters, beyond being believable, are also relatable. Because I think there is some level... I mean, this is fiction. So like they say in Three Penny Opera, this is opera and not life. So the situations that these characters are going to find themselves in are not the kinds of situations, the kinds of specific situations, at least, that you or I are going to find ourselves in. Hopefully we are not going to live in a post-apocalyptic hellscape and we will not have to deal with raiders and the remnants of the Enclave and the Brotherhood of Steel running around, right? But I think that as long as we can see in the reactions of these characters and how they handle these situations a little bit of ourselves or a little bit of people that we know, because even though you might think, well, I wouldn't have reacted like Beth did here, or I wouldn't have done what Beth did here, if you can relate to it and understand it, maybe even go, mm, but my friend probably would have done that, or you know, maybe my dad would have reacted like that when he was that age if he was presented with a situation like that. Those are the kinds of things that, that we can really hang our hat on and make sure that we have characters here that, that people are going to understand and, and, and that seem like actual, honest-to-goodness human beings. And I think that, that shows that, that don't concentrate as heavily on characters and character dynamics can maybe get away with a little bit of that more than I could. But even then, and it could just be the, the kind of a listener or the kind of a reader or the kind of a watcher I am, even if I'm watching or listening to or reading something that's a heavy genre piece, I'm still going to be jarred out of the story if I don't believe the characters or if I can't relate to the characters at all. And it doesn't have to be a character who's like me. I mean, don't get me wrong, mass media is filled with people like me. But I can still relate to Commander Data from Star Trek, who's an android, or to Mr. Spock from Star Trek, or to Luke Skywalker, who is a chosen figure in the Star Wars universe, right? I'm not like them, but I can still relate to them. And I think that's the kind of thing that can separate a good story from a great story. Because even in heavy genre pieces, I think when you take a look at the stuff that's, that's you know, just really enjoyable, popcorn fare, you know, a good story, something that you really enjoy sitting down and watching, and the kind of thing that really ropes you in and that really engages you, it's, it's that character stuff. It's not just about what happens. It's not just about the shooty bang bang. That can be a very important part. There can be nuanced applications of that kind of thing. But if you really want to push it over the edge and turn it into something truly awesome, you got to nail that character stuff. You got to make it all believable. You got to make the characters believable. How they relate has to be believable. How they talk has to be believable. Because I've seen, and I'll say one criticism that I've had of myself in the way that I write dialogue, and I have been bailed out by my voice actors here a few times, is that I can sometimes write dialogue that's a little bit samey. And what I mean by that is, if you look at it on the page, the, the flow, the rhythm, the cadence, not the phrases they use necessarily, but, but there's a, a commonality between the way that each character approaches dialogue, that if you were just reading it, it wouldn't be as easy as you would necessarily want it to, to separate who's talking if you didn't have it listed next to their name. But that said, I know how people talk, and I'm able to craft dialogue that sounds like two people talking. Another thing that will that will take me out of a story immediately, whether it's something I'm watching, listening to, or reading, is if characters are just standing there spouting exposition at each other, that will turn me off. I just, I'm sure that there are people who enjoy that kind of thing. I am not one of them. And as a result, I am not going to write a story that, that has a lot of that. If information is to be presented, and I don't always succeed at this, but if information is to be presented, I want it to be presented in a logical, flowing way and not just a person walking into a, into a room and saying, well, here's this piece of information. It, you know, the way that they made fun of it in Austin Powers, where you had Basil Exposition, you know, just lampshading that whole trope of a character who exists solely to provide information to the audience. I feel like if I do that and I have found myself in a position where I've had to do it, I feel like I've failed if I do that. I need to be able to convey information to the audience in a better way. So I think I've beaten that tangent about as much as I possibly can. It still falls under the brief, I think. If you squint, I think it still falls under the, the character matters brief, but it is not specific to Beth. It's really more about how I handle characters in general. So I apologize for jumping off on a tangent like that, but I do think it's important not only to inform the, the process of, of how I create Beth 
and how I use her in the story. But I also think it's also a, you know, a useful look into my creative process in terms of how I handle providing information and how I handle characters interacting and that kind of thing. So I, I hope that you'll forgive my, uh, my indiscretion there. So getting back to some Beth specific stuff, uh, a couple other little nuggets of information. I mentioned this, I think in passing on Twitter here and there, Beth is named in honor of somebody. I am not going to reveal who she's named in honor of, but I will just say that it is an actual living person that, um, that is very special to me. So it, the character itself is not an homage to her. There, there's very little in common with, with the actual person aside from maybe her height. But, um, I, I wanted to, uh, to honor her in that way. And it's, it's silly and it's sappy, but you know what? It's my story. And I guess if I want to do something silly and sappy like that, it doesn't, it doesn't take away from the story itself. I, I, I think it's something that's, that's at least a little bit forgivable. So I think that's really it in terms of the Beth's origin story, where the character came from, the, the kinds of decisions that, that formed her and formed her place in the story and really formed the story because it's really Beth and how I envisioned her and Odessa and how I envisioned her and then how those two characters sort of mesh together that really forms the basis of the story. Everything came out of that. The overarching plot, the, the mystery plot that we have driving the, driving the season, that all came from Beth's background as a spy and also Odessa's background as someone who seeks technology and ways to use it to, to better mankind. And another aspect of this is that Beth is, in a way, kind of the mother of the rest of the characters in the show. Almost every other character, with the exception of the Brotherhood of Steel characters that I have in the show, all of them were created because I thought, okay, I need to have this character, right? I need to have Beth's ex-girlfriend that she's best friends with now, and that's how Amanda came about. I need Beth's parents, and that's where Andrew and Elise came out. I need Beth's trusted confidant and another person that works with her father, and that's where Charles came from. So, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, Beth is sort of at the top of the family tree of characters that appear in this story. So that's kind of an interesting thing that maybe we can go into a little bit if we discuss those characters. And I think Amanda is a character that is really ripe for that kind of discussion because there's a lot of neat stuff that went in there. Personal experiences, the experiences of friends, all of those kinds of things. I think Amanda, more than any other character, is kind of a melting pot of a character where I, I took aspects of people that I knew and experiences that, the, that they had and experiences that I had and used them to build a character that was really compelling. And then when we were able to get Lucy Middleton to play the role, well, Katie barred the door because she is such an amazing voice actress. You have someone like that and you can you, you can really open things up and you can go in a lot of different directions. And there, there's there's nothing that she can't do. And I wanted to very much take advantage of that. And that is such a great thing to have at your disposal. She has so much talent and she works so hard and she, she brings so much to any role that she plays. You know, I have an embarrassment of riches with this cast in general. Like when Letitia expressed interest in playing Beth, I was absolutely floored. I've said that before, but it's one of those things where I did not expect someone like Letitia to want to be a part of this show. Because keep in mind, the show hadn't released an episode. Even the prologue hadn't been released at that point. I think I had two scripts that she was able to take a look at. And just based on that, she wanted to play this character. And man, that made me feel really good. And she's been absolutely amazing. And of course, Vitriol playing Odessa, I heard her in the Modus Files Halloween episode. And when I heard that, I was like, I need her to play Odessa. <laughs> you know, I didn't want anybody else. I, I don't, I probably wouldn't have, you know, pulled the plug on production if, if she didn't want to play the role, but I think the show would be significantly worse had she not agreed to. And I mean, honestly, I can say that for, for pretty much every character that's, that's in this thing. You know, you have John Laurie who plays Knight Banks, who's a, who's a professional uh, out in Hollywood and he comes in and man, in a relatively small role, he knocks it out of the park. So I have been so fortunate for all of the people that have been associated with, with this because, you know, I can, I can write decently well, but what they have done and what they have taken off the page and turned into the words that they say has been, I hear them say this stuff sometimes. And I'm like, 
did I write that? Because you know they, they bring so much more to it than I put on the page. So uh, that's, again, not related directly to Beth, but I can't say enough good things about the people that have been involved with this production. So thank you again for indulging me as I go off on another tangent. But really, that's it. Um, that's all I wanted to talk about for this Character Matters mini-sode regarding our lead character, Elizabeth Kirby. We'll see how it goes. This is, this is my first crack at this. So um, if people enjoy it, uh, we'll continue to do them. Um, I can certainly sit and talk in front of a microphone for a half hour. That's not a problem for me. And please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, Once Upon 76 Pod. You can email me at info at onceuponawasteland.com if you have questions if you have suggestions for future minisodes, if you have anything like that, I am always happy to hear from people. If you have, you know, even criticisms or feedback that might be, you know, not uh, all sunshine and roses, that's okay too. I like, well, I don't say I like hearing it, but I appreciate hearing it because it shows that you, you're listening and you care enough to point something like that out that you maybe didn't necessarily care for. So I welcome that kind of feedback as well. So anyway, Thank you so much for listening to this mini-sode, and thank you for listening to the show in general. For supporting us by amplifying our posts on Twitter, for telling your friends, for leaving ratings and reviews, all of it is vastly appreciated. I'm Brad Williams, and this has been Once Upon a Wasteland, Character Matters, Elizabeth Kirby. 